Hopefully he's close. Here he comes. Here comes Benny Hill. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for being here, wonderful people of God. And this is the first time that I meet this wonderful man of God right here. So what a precious, uh, what a precious heart he has. And I see why the Lord has so blessed him because he loves the Lord. And when I walked in just a few, just a little while ago, and I met him for the, for the, for the first time, you just can see it. You see how easily it is for us to recognize someone who loves Jesus like that. Let's all stand and thank the Lord for his mercy. And Lord, I thank you today. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege. What a privilege you've given us to be called your children. What a high privilege we all have to be sons and daughters of the God of glory, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is our God, our God, our Heavenly Father, all because of what you've done, wonderful Savior, wonderful Jesus, wonderful Jesus. Bless your people tonight, I pray, Lord. They haven't come to hear me tonight. They've come to hear your voice. Magnify your holy name. And we will, we will give you the glory. We will give you the honor and all the praise. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display then sings my soul my Savior God how great you are Lord then sings my I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in when on the cross there on the cross my burdens gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin Then sings my soul My Savior God Wonderful Lord How great Thou art How great Yes. 
Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God Just a whisper now. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. The great God, we give you praise. Blessed be your name. God Almighty. Then sings my soul. Tonight we have come to adore you, blessed Jesus. We've come to worship you, wonderful Lord. Your people have come to feel your touch, to hear your voice. And I pray that your presence, your wonderful presence, not one will leave the same tonight because of it. Let your dear presence be so real. For where we are, we've gathered together, you'll be there, you said. Every eye closed, please. Shh, not a sound made, please. Every hand uplifted for just a minute. Glory to the Lamb. Wonderful Lord. Forget yourself now. Forget your troubles. Just see Him. The one who is worthy of our love. And our worship. And our surrender. Jesus, precious Savior. In glory. Glory, glory to the Lamb. Glory, glory to the Lamb. For you are glorious and worthy to be praised. You're the Lamb upon the throne and unto you. We lift our voice in praise, you're the Lamb upon glory. All the glory, all the honor. We give you all the praise.
Jesus and God's people said God's people said God's people said let's give the Lord a mighty hand please amen you may be seated I want to just talk to you heart to heart one on one just for, for the next few minutes <clears throat> because I have not been to this beautiful place before. And some of you probably have not seen me minister yet. How many have in the past? Okay, nice number. How many have not? Oh my. <laughs> I need to let you kind of uh, know a few things about me. <laughs> <clears throat> you have to understand, I began preaching when I was 21. I'm 70 now. That's a long time ago. And you learn a lot about ministry, a lot about God's people, about atmosphere and the importance of having the right atmosphere protected. Because you see, the thing that uh, people don't understand is the danger of distraction. So the Lord says to his disciples, now you go and you heal the sick. But on the way, don't even say hello. Salute no man. That means don't say hello even if they say hello. Now that sounds hard, but now it, it really isn't. Elisha said to Gehazi, now you take my staff, you lay it on that boy, on the way, salute no man. So in scripture, we, we, we see so much about the Holy Spirit that some people miss. He's gentle. He's gentle. Easily wounded. Easily grieved. Because it says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Now, I did not know much about the Holy Spirit till I heard Miss Kuhlman, Catherine Kuhlman. Now, I don't think a lot of you probably even uh, attended her meetings. I suppose maybe some are still alive. Well, <laughs> Pastor Andrew. How many besides the two of us ever came, went to Catherine's? Okay, well, still some are around. <laughs> but Miss Kuhlman was a mighty vessel of the kingdom. And uh, some people did not understand why she was so dramatic. And sometimes she'd say, now softly, hallelujah. And I wondered like, why softly? There were times she was so dramatic uh, that you just stood there in amazement. <laughs> and uh, but the greatest moment of my life was in her meeting, December 21, 1973, when suddenly she began to sob at First Presbyterian Church, Pittsburgh. Uh, that moment changed my life. Otto Roberts told me something one day. He said, Benny, always realize the anointing is coming to you or passing by you. It depends on what you do that moment. If you miss it, it'll never come that way again. That was powerful. Well, I did not miss it that morning. <clears throat> so I look at this lady. Now you have to understand, I'd, I'd never been to any such meeting like that. I don't, uh, I had no idea what I was getting into. I went to a great church in Canada called the Catacombs. Now the Catacombs, that's where Jehovah Jireh was written. We you all sing the song Jehovah Jireh was written by Merla Watson. Merla Watson is in, in her 80s right now, living in Vancouver with her husband, Merv. And it was a glorious move of God in Canada where they would meet in a big cathedral called St. Paul 
on Bloor Street, 3,000 kids, I was one of them, and there was a lot of noise, tambourines and dancing and you name it, you know. But noise, noise. And some people thought noise was power. And I remember a young man who was demon-possessed, the poor fella. And um, <clears throat> every Sunday night, they would have a glory time after the service. Not an altar call, glory time. That means everyone got to the altar and had church all over again. <laughs> and this kid comes up who was demon-possessed, and he was shaking. Now, he was shaking not because of the anointing of God, because he was demon-possessed. And the people thought that God was on him and anointing him, and they were all trying to rub something off of that poor guy. <laughs> because they were so hungry for something real. They saw that man doing this a little bit, and they all wanted to take off whatever they thought he had, and they thought that anointing was from God. It was not the anointing. It was just a devil. And it really was troubling to me because I thought, wow, you know, they're, they're so hungry. I recognized that even at my young age, I was saved when I, when, when I was 19 years old. It happened maybe a few months after that. Even I recognized that there was something wrong with that guy. Now I go to Catherine's meeting and I'm amazed that it's at nine o'clock in the morning is the service and you had to be in line at 1 a.m. 1 a.m. You had to get up out of bed and go line up in the cold weather. It was December, Pittsburgh freezing out there so i'm one of those people out there at 1 a.m i see all these people out there it was dark the sun hadn't come up yet and people singing hallelujah and other songs and i'm shaking because i was cold now the you know after a while everything was fine because the crowd got thicker and you know once they get thicker you get a little warm and I was all in my hat and the stuff over my ears you know all that stuff you know. We waited on, out that door for hours. The doors open at eight a.m., but about about six a.m. I began feeling a trembling, but I wasn't cold now. I was cold before that. I'm trembling without knowing why am I trembling. And now the doors open and everyone, this first time even in my life, I never saw people run down the aisle. <laughs> Were you also one of those people? <laughs> Me too, yeah. We all ran, I'm thinking why we're running, but we just ran like a race and got as close as possible in our seat. So now the building seated 700. Now it looked like 7,000. 700 people only would fit in that beautiful first Presbyterian church in Pittsburgh. Now I'm sitting there and I'm still trembling. My coat is off, my you know, head is off, all that. And an hour later, Catherine comes out. For two hours I'm shaking. She comes up, and when she came on, I thought Jesus walked into that building because the atmosphere changed so drastically. I'm talking about Mount of Transfiguration moment. Like Jesus was more real than my skin. More real than anyone next to me. So real, it's impossible to describe the reality of that moment. He was there in glory. And I was so amazed. All I could say is, have mercy on me. I felt filthy, you know. That's what happened to Isaiah, you know, when the glory of God came. He saw his sin. And, and Peter said, depart from me. I'm a sinner to the Lord. The first thing that happens to you in the presence of God is you see your sin. You see how your inability to be righteous, you know. You can't do it on your own. And all I said is, have mercy on me. 
And I heard him clearly say, my mercy is abundant on you. And then as Catherine began to lead in worship, I felt this breeze somewhere. I thought, I'm feeling it on my hands and my, and I looked around, I thought somebody must have opened a window. Not a window was open. It was a moment that changed my life. And then later, the miracles began, and the presence of God was just so incredibly amazing. Catherine introduced a lady from Australia who had been healed. And she's up there talking to the lady, and the lady's talking about how God healed her of cancer in one of Catherine's meetings. Now, while I'm sitting there the whole time, I'm, I'm feeling this blanket of love around me. I didn't recognize the Holy Spirit like I do today, but it was like a blanket around my, my body of just pure love. Now, I'm listening to that woman up there, that lady from Australia, talk about her healing, and then a thought, Andrew, a thought came into my mind. I don't believe it. That whole beautiful feeling lifted. Like that glory just lifted. And I began crying, oh, Lord, no, no, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Whew, came right back. <laughs> That's how sensitive he is. I didn't realize till that moment, you can lose that blessed presence of God with a question of doubt. Now, I'm sitting the whole, there, uh, the whole time there just m amazed. And at one moment, Miss Kuman starts sobbing, sobbing. She lifts her, her head up, was red, like red, like fire, you know, on it. Please, and she began begging, please don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And I had never heard someone talk like that. And then she said, he's all I have. He's all I got. Now, when she said the following words, something erupted in me. When she said, he's more real to me than you. And cry, Lord, I want to meet you like that. I want to know you like that. Well, nothing happened at that moment, but now we go home on the bus, seven hour drive from Pittsburgh to where we lived in, in Toronto. I'm exhausted, I'm tired. I'm thinking about that service the whole time. But I felt someone pull me to my knees. And I get on my knees. And out of my mouth, I hear myself say, Holy Spirit, Catherine Kuman said you're a friend. Can I know you? Can you be my friend? And the same atmosphere that was in that service was now in my bedroom. And it changed my life. That was the beginning of what God you know, has, has done in all these years. But I want to tell you about one experience <clears throat> that people don't even know because I don't talk about it often. Catherine Kuman died in, she went to heaven in, on February 20th, 1976. I had never met her, never met her. I was supposed to meet her the last service that she had had because they got to know me, the staff got to know me, especially a lady named Marty Phillips. Marty was Catherine Kuman's assistant uh, in Canada. She ran the Canadian office for Catherine Kuhlman. And, Ma and dear Marty and I became friends. She began attending my meetings in Canada. I began preaching in 74. And the Canadian people began to come and so forth. And to my shock, Marty said, we're gonna take you down with me to Pittsburgh. We're gonna meet Miss Kuhlman. Okay, and I was excited. But Catherine didn't show up because that day, she was in the hospital and passed away shortly thereafter. And then a year later, a man named David Versilli, who was the pastor of the church Miss Kuman had in Youngstown, Ohio, left the foundation, left their ministry, and Marty called. Well, she said, Maggie, now I never met Maggie before, only Marty, only Marty that I met on, on, on her staff. Catherine staff, and I did not meet Miss Kuman, not, not even for a second. 
Marty calls, she says, Maggie wants you to conduct the memorial service for Catherine Kuhlman. I said, what did you say? Say that again? Maggie wants you to conduct the service, the memorial service. Now that's a year later, a year after Ms. Kuhlman passed away. Well, I was shocked. I was 24 years old, never met Ms. Kuhlman. I wouldn't even have known what to say about her. So I get to the office at the Carlton House Hotel at that time on the seventh floor, and there I met Jimmy McDonald and Maggie Hartner and Ruth Fisher, all the beautiful people that became my, my, my wonderful family later. And Maggie sits there behind the desk. Now, all these women had long fingers. <laughs> all of Catherine's girls had long fingers. So Maggie looks at me, she said, now kiddo, that's what she called me, I don't know why. Now kiddo, we want you to conduct the service. And she tells me about, they're going to show the film that Miss Kuman had allowed. The only time Miss Kuman allowed a service to be filmed was Las Vegas, May of 75. So anything you see on YouTube was hidden cameras. That's a fact, okay? Anything from Tulsa or Roberts University or Melody Land, she did not even know she was being taped. Guaranteed. The only service was Las Vegas, May of 75, when she was invited by the mayor of Las Vegas to conduct the service. Anyway, so they said, we're going to show it. It's called Dry Land Living Water. You can still get it and watch it. So I, they, they were there to show the film, and Jimmy McDonald would introduce me before the film, and then he's going to sing the song, Jesus, there's something about that name, I'm, I'm to walk out. So I said, fine. And then she said something profound that I did not understand back then. Now, kiddo, don't you go and pray and get all tied up with yourself so God cannot use you. Go take a nap. Amen. I said, tell me that again. You heard me. I walked out thinking, this is the most unspiritual woman I'd ever met in my life. Because what she was telling me is, go sleep, don't pray. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to pray all right. So I get to my hotel room there at the William Penn Hotel, it's still there. And I'm begging God, you know, <laughs> to anoint me and use me. I get to the service. Wow. Carnegie Music Hall. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I did not know where the service was when I got to the office. Nobody told me where the service would be. It's at Carnegie. You know what, what Carnegie is, right? Like, very nice place. And beautiful balconies and beautiful curtain and wow, velvet and you name it. And I look and I see the place packed with people that came to honor Catherine Kuma's memory. They didn't even know who I was. Then I see her choir, all dressed beautifully, all the women in gowns and all the men in tuxedos. And at that afternoon, by the way, Jimmy McDonald said, well, you, do you have a tuxedo? I said, no. He said, well, let's go get one now. You, you, you're going to need one. I said, why? He said, because everybody will be in tuxedos. You got to have a tuxedo. Let's go rent one. I said, fine, let's go. Anyways... I saw that crowd and I got scared. And I thought, what am I doing here? So now Jimmy gets up there, introduces me, they show the film, and then an usher comes and gets me. I was sitting way in the back. I saw I walk all the way around, come behind the curtain, and Jimmy says, now we're going to sing Jesus, the Sunday by that name, and Ben Hinn will walk on. And they start singing but no Benny, because I'm scared back there. <laughs> I was frozen scared back there. I was just terrified. And he sang it for the second time. And then he says, we're going to sing the song for the last time, and Benny Hinn will walk on the platform. An usher pushed me, <laughs> physically pushed me out on the platform. Now, you got to understand, that Miss Kuban was dramatic and she liked spotlights. And the lights were somewhat a little dim, but not too much dim. 
And so I'm pushed on the platform and those spotlights are on me and I could not see the crowd. I just saw faces, but I didn't see who they were. And it was a frightening moment. And I'm thinking, dear God, what do I do now? Because the musicians got so tired of playing the song, they changed it. <laughs> you, know what, you know what happens to you when you're scared? Your, your brain freezes. And all you can think about is to do the same thing you heard already. Do it again. Sing it again. Whatever. I tried to sing the song, Jesus. There is something, but I sang it so high, nobody could follow me. <laughs> so I stopped. I'm going I'm to show you what, what the Lord is like. I stopped. I looked up and said, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, I cannot do it. And I heard him say, I'm glad. Now I will. And the power of God, I promise you this happened. The power of God hit that building. The miracles, when I said I cannot do it, that's all. That was my sermon. <laughs> I cannot do it. He said, I'm glad, now I will. The ladies, when, when the anointing hit, they all recognized it. Maggie and Ruth Fisher, all of them, began running down the aisle getting healings up. I'm thinking, dear God, I can't believe this. I didn't even say anything. <laughs> I didn't even sing the right song. I mean, with the right key. I messed it all up. And the presence of the Lord just shoo, comes right in like that. For four hours, I stood on that platform watching healings coming one after the other. And I'm, I'm, I'm amazed because I didn't do anything. <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit. What he wants is yielded vessels. See, sometimes we don't know, oh dear God. So tonight I just want you to relax. You're not going to get healed if you get all tied up. God cannot get through that. Let him do it. Don't beg. A man of God years ago said, there's no begging in love. Amen. Don't beg. Just receive. Just receive. So simple, really. Now listen, before I minister the word, and I have a very special word for you today. And it's important because today we are living, sadly, <clears throat> where people are questioning scripture. And people are questioning things like, is Jesus the only way to heaven? And people are, are uh, talking about things like, is Jesus God or the Son of God? Uh, these are questions that should not be even, uh, you know, asked if we know the Bible. Look, look. The problem today is people don't really know the Old Testament. They don't know the Scriptures. So I'm going to give you just, just a few tips that will help you, okay? And please hear me very, very carefully. Because you're going to need this one day. Someone will come and ask you those questions. Ask them this question. If, when they begin to ask questions about the Bible, just say, how many prophecies are in... Uh, other books of other religions, you can be specific, okay? Like the Book of Mormon or the Book of this or whatever book out there that religions have. Just ask, how many prophecies are in the Book of Buddha, let's say, or other books? Zero. Zero. How many prophecies are in the Bible? 2,500. How many of them fulfilled? 2,000. God Almighty has given us incredible guarantees that his word is reliable. How? Fulfilled prophecy. Peter talks about his experience on the Mount of, of Transfiguration and then he says, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. Meaning, the Bible is more powerful than the vision they had. 
and what they saw with their own eyes, they saw the Lord gloriously transfigured. They saw Elijah, they saw Moses, they saw the glory of God, they heard the Lord's voice say, this is my son. Yet Peter says, we have a more short sure word that you should take heed and listen to. All right? So the word of God cannot be denied when you look at prophecy. And I don't mean prophecy for people to prophesy. I mean prophecy in the Old Testament about the coming of the Lord, first coming, second coming, what God has done to nations that have risen and fallen or the nation of Israel. But God knew that people would question prophecy. So he gave us proof in history. How many documents today in the world that would say that Augustus Caesar existed? Nine. That's nine. And yet nobody questions that Caesar existed with nine documents. How many documents, historical documents, some of them written by atheists, say that Jesus existed? 39, almost 40. Yet people question that. But God went beyond that. He went into archaeology. I was standing, Brother Andrew, I was standing at the Pool of Siloam when they found it in Jerusalem. They were digging, digging, when they found the steps that go up from the pool to Temple Mount, mentioned in Ezra, mentioned in the Bible. I was with them digging the dirt. I was seeing the Bible, everything the Bible said in reality, okay? I found coins. There were coins everywhere. I put some in my pocket. <laughs> I just cleaned the dirt off and put them in my pocket. I don't think you can do that now, but it was. So today you go to Israel, the Bible has become the roadmap to archaeology. Very reliable. But we Christians don't need history or archaeology. We just need to know prophecy. Okay. And today people are questioning the deity of the Lord. Let me give you some help here, okay? There are five things that prove deity. What makes God God? Number one, omnipotence. Number two, omniscience. Number three, omnipresence. Number four, unchangeable Lord, never changes. And five, eternal. Jesus fits every one of them. Every one of them. You just read it in the Bible. How about offices? Now, I only gave you five. There's more than that. How about offices? For God to be God, he must be creator. For God to be God, he must be preserver. For God to be God, he must forgive sin. For God to be God, he must raise the dead. For God to be God, he must impart life eternal. Jesus fits every one of them. So when people question, is Jesus God? They don't know the Bible. And the people said? Amen. So it's time you start reading the scriptures. You promise, right? Because it's the only thing that will keep you safe in the future. You cannot survive tomorrow without the word of God. You, you, you're not going to. All right. Lift your, lift your hands to heaven. Lord, thank you. I have given them some good advice. I pray you'll help them remember it. And Lord, we wait tonight upon you. We're, we're anxious to hear your voice. To you be the praise. And God's people said, Amen. Now, I'm going to start with my message right now. And I'm going to kind of prepare you for what I'm going to talk about. Let me just read a scripture here. And yes, I'm sure many of you tonight came to be healed. I understand that wonderful miracles have been taking place here already. And uh, 
I have to use my iPad today for my Bible because my eyes are not what they used to be. My, my Bible that I used to preach from for years is all full of colors and notes. And, and it's hard to read it now, you know, when you get old like that. Let's go <clears throat> to Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> Thank you for the water down here. Mark 16, 16. Lord, I thank you for helping me, and I thank you for enabling your people to receive this clearly. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. These are some of the last words the Lord spoke before ascending to glory, and none more important to be spoken to the sons of men. And when you read these words, they are so important that they call our most diligent attention because in them are set the terms of eternal life or eternal death. It says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not, shall be damned. So, <clears throat> what does it mean when we say believe? What does it mean? All right, very important. And I'll, I'll explain that a little further. I really sought the Lord on this because of what's going on today, what's, what's happening in this world. But I want to read 2 Peter 1.10. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. There's one thing always on my mind. How am I going to finish this race? I didn't think those things 10, ten years ago. I'm not the same Benny Hinn of 10 years ago. I was in the hospital in 2015 with congestive heart failure. My ejection fraction was down to 14. Now you are doctors and nurses know, like my dear friend Don Colbert down here and Mary, he's my doctor right there. The most famous doctor in the body of Christ right here. Stand up so they can see you and, and Mary, will you? <clears throat> and he knows I was this close to dying. I was living in California at the time. They rushed me to emergency. A doctor from the Philippines, Tian Sung, was amazing. I walk into the hospital. The man begins to weep. I never even met him in all my life. He looks at me, says, I know who you are, and I will not let you die. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm dying. <laughs> they rush me in. They put LASIK in my system, pump all the, the liquids out of my lungs and all that. I was in there for two weeks intensive care because I had always had AFib, you know, where your heart beats too fast and all that. I have a dream when I came out of the hospital. Think. Now, I've shared this, but some of you probably never heard me talk about it. I, I had a dream that shook me to my core. I see myself standing with other people in a straight line, dressed in white robes. I see a gate, beautiful gate in front of me, sparkling like diamonds. I see the Lord on the right side of that gate. I see a lady I knew who is in heaven today named Jeannie Klattenberg on the left, sitting on an organ, playing the organ. And now the Lord 
does this and the gate opens and she played this heavenly beautiful music came out of that organ as the gates opened and that person went into glory then the gates closed and then the lord did this again for the next one in line and beautiful music comes out and the gate opens and then the lord did this and the most frightening music came out of the organ and suddenly two massive men whom i'm sure were angels came and took that man out of the line brother andrew i will never forget the fear on that man's face that hit him and there were a few in that line i was one of them and now my turn came and the lord just looked at me Jeannie was looking at the Lord. Is it yes? Is it no for Benny? <laughs> and you can just imagine that moment in, in that because I, could, I can still feel it right now. And I woke up with his voice ringing in my ears. I'm watching you. Don't blow it. <laughs> no, this is serious stuff. Don't blow it. You know, people have said, well, well, why do you share that? Paul the Apostle said, I keep under my body and keep it under subjection, lest after I have preached to others, I be a castaway. 2010, 11 and 13 were my, my worst years of my life. Worst years. After preaching to millions around the world, I went through a terrible experience with my home. It nearly ruined me. It didn't affect the anointing on me because the anointing on me is a gift. It affected what was happening in me. Now, I'm not going to get into it except to tell you it was dangerous for me at that time. This was before the hospital experience. 2010, 11, and 12. Horrible years. 2015, I'm in the hospital. Now, I think today, how am I going to finish? Because it doesn't matter how you start. It's how you finish. So, you sweet people of God, every one of you will have to give an account we will all stand before his judgment seat. And many will come in that day saying, Lord, Lord. And he'll say, I don't know you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. That's a frightening part of the Bible. Huh? So our job is, how are we going to finish? And I have already made a decision. I will finish better than I began. And here's how. Here's how. Get to know the scriptures. Get to really know the scriptures. Mel and Hickey, back 10 years ago or more now, challenged me. She said, Benny, I read my Bible three times a year. How many times do you read your Bible a year? I said, oh, you know, a good once a year, yeah, maybe a little more. I challenge you to read your Bible three times a year. I took that challenge. I'm sitting watching Netflix one night, seven years ago, at least maybe eight years ago, and the, and the Lord said, cancel it. I canceled it. Days later, he said, now, cancel cable. I canceled it. Cancel direct TV. I canceled it. There's no TV. You cannot watch TV in my place. What do I do at night? I read the scriptures and church history. My life has been totally changed by reading four times now Fox's Book of Martyrs. It'll, shook, it'll shake you up like it shook me up. Because you ask yourself, am I a Christian? Can I really sing praise like Jan Hus and burn at the same time? Can I really sing praise like William Tyndale? powerful but it's the scriptures we need because they keep us a pastor who worked with me 
a pastor of a large church. I took him to Patmos, Greece. I was doing programs on the book of Revelation. And that man of a big church sat there and told me he knew nothing about the book. Because I said, it's time to talk, it's time to work, come on. Because I flew him there first class, paid his hotel, and he just sat there staring at me the whole time. Finally, I said, listen here, it's time to work. I did four programs by myself. And he would not even say a word. He looked at me and said, I know nothing about the book. I said, what? I said, what are you doing being a pastor? He rebukes me, said, oh, come on, Benny. He said, you're dealing with God's agenda for the ages. I'm dealing with my people's troubles. I said, what, what books do you read? And because I asked him, I said, how many books of the Bible have you not read? He said he read most of Genesis, some of Exodus. He didn't read any of Leviticus. A pastor. I was in shock. He said he read the, the whole New Testament, but didn't really read the whole Old Covenant. I said, you're in danger. I said, the devil is waiting to sift you and destroy you because there's nothing in you to fight with. He went to New York, overdosed on drugs, and died. He's dead now. Without the Bible, you have no weapon against the devil. Get it in your head. Get to know the scriptures. Today, I read my Bible three times a year. I've been doing it for eight years now, almost. It's changed my life. And here's what I found. I found something quite amazing as I'm reading the word. All right. <clears throat> we're going to go to Acts chapter 8 for just a moment. And we're going to read verse 9 right through 13. There was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that for a long time he had bewitched them with sorcery. But when they believed Philip's preaching, the things concerning the kingdom of God... And the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now watch this. Then Simon himself believed. Stop, stop, stop. Did he really? Simon himself believed. And he was baptized. He continued now with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles, signs, which were done, hold it now for a minute. Because in verse 18, it says, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be, may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Stop. Stop. Did he really believe? Did he really accept the Lord as Savior? Well, let's talk a little more about this. Uh, how about King Agrippa? Paul said, now you believe the prophets, but was he saved? No. All right. Why was Abraham declared righteous? Because it says he believed in, in, not about, in God. Now there's a big difference between in and and at, or that, or on. So, I believe that Jesus came to earth. So does the devil. I believe that he healed the sick. So does the devil. I believe that he died on a cross. So does the devil. 
I believe that he rose from the dead. So does the devil. I believe he shed his blood. So does the devil. I believe he's coming back to us. So does the devil. But the devil doesn't trust him. He doesn't trust the Lord. To believe in, that's the key. Not to believe that, that, that. Today what is being taught out there is, do you believe that, 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 and that? Listen now. Do you believe that I exist? Come on. Do you believe that I exist? If you do, put your hands up high. Thank you. Do you believe in me? Uh, wait, hold it, hold it. Somebody said yes. To believe in me, give me your soul to keep. Give me your money to keep. You can't. Why? Because you can't believe in a human being. Because to believe in means give them your soul to keep it for you. Give them your money to keep it for you. You can only believe in one person, Jesus. To him you surrender. Surrender means believe in. Trust in. You give him your soul. You give him your heart. You give him your life. You give him your all. The devil will never do that. To believe in is not to believe that. To believe in is not to believe on. Let's show something else. Show something else. Okay, so. I'm reading today, and we've, we've all read beautiful, that wonderful portion in John. <clears throat> so, in John chapter 8, you all remember that? Okay. It says, many believed on him. John 8, 30. Many believed on him, but they didn't believe in him. Why? Because in verse 44, the Lord says to them, the devil is your father. And in verse 59, they wanted to throw stones at him because he said that he said, before Abram was, I am. And they wanted to throw rocks at him. Did they really believe in him? No. They believed on him, but not in him. Today, many in the church believe that. Believe on, not in. To believe in declares you're righteous. Abraham believed in God. Complete trust in the Lord. I mean, you think about Acts 16, and there's a mistranslation there in verse 30. He believed on the Lord and his whole house. Later, you see, it, it, it gets you know, cleared up. He believed in God with his house. So to believe in the Lord... It's full surrender. Full surrender to Jesus. Daily. Daily. All right. Look, we have to, we have to, we have to finish well. We have no choice. To whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of life. Enter in, Matthew 7, 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few, oh dear God, few, not many, few there be that find it. Enter in at the straight gate. And you know what that word straight means, right? Narrow. Wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate. Yeah. Narrow, and that word, by the way, here is difficult. 
is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Saints, I have made my decision. I will find it, and I have. And here it is. Here it is. Very little today is taught about this that I'm going to talk about to you, with you. But let's just, let's just look at this portion first, and then I'm going to give you something to think about. A sower, Luke 8, 5, a sower went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some fell by the wayside. It was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Some fell upon a rock. As soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried. He was saying to all of them, pay attention. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear it. Why? In the Holy Land, in the Holy Land, they used to put, uh, when, when, I, when I was young, they would put walls as a fence around a farm or around some land they were sowing seed into. And the sower would go sowing that seed and some would fall on the actual fence and the birds would come and get it. And that's what the Lord said, that the, that word was stolen by the enemy when they asked him later about the parable. He said, those by the wayside are they that hear and then comes the devil, verse 12, and takes away the word out of their hearts. They on the rock, verse 13, are they when they hear, they receive the word with joy, but they have no depth. They believe for a while, but then in times of temptation, they fall away. And those that fell among thorns are they which when they heard go forth are choked with the cares and riches and pleasure. But it says they go forth. They ask, at, at least they begin living the life for a short time. But it says that, that the cares and riches and pleasures of this life bring no fruit to perfection. All right. Those that fell on the side fell on the rocks. The birds came and took it. The devil stole it. Those that fell by the rocks, no depth, and it, it had no life, no moisture. Those that fell among the thorns, cares of this life. Cares of this life. Listen to me. A soldier of Jesus Christ should not be entangled in the affairs of this life. That's what Paul told Timothy. That's our greatest danger today. So a lot of you today, okay, you're, you're in. Maybe not all the way yet, but you're, you're on your way. The devil didn't steal the word when you heard it. You had good depth in you, so you had some good fruit. But now you're at this third stage. The cares of this life, they're still here, Josh. They're still here, Doc. They're still here. Now, how do I deal with this? What, what do I do? What do I do to make, to make sure? All right. And this is something very, very important because... All right, let's just go back to Matthew 7 just one more time. I want to point out something to you as I'm talking about this because I came, I believe, with what the Lord put on my heart. Verse 21, Matthew 7, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many, many, yeah, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils. In thy name done many wonderful works. Then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. These words scare me. They should scare you too. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And then he tells us the key. He said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. How do I 
build my house upon the rock. <sighs> All right, I, I, I'm going to jump a little bit to a portion here. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Deny self. If you love your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your children more than me, if you love them more than me, you're not worthy. If you don't hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, and your own life, you cannot be my disciple. He said that. He said that. Meaning the cost is high. Your greatest enemy is what? Self. I am not afraid of the devil. I really am not. I've seen his majesty twice. That's plenty for one lifetime. I've seen the devil. Of course I have. We have a weapon. More powerful than any devil. It's called the word of God. And once we know it. And use it. He'll, he'll flee. You resist him with the scriptures. Not with experience. Not experience. Listen to me. Here's Jesus. Get the picture. Jesus, River Jordan, he's baptized. The Holy Ghost comes like a dove. Now the voice of God, this is my son. Angels heard that. Demons heard that. The devil heard that. Now, a few days later, the devil comes. If you are the son of God. Jesus could have said, weren't you there? Didn't you hear God say that? He didn't say that. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. What was he saying? He was saying the word is more powerful than my experience. Because his experience, his experience was powerful. God spoke audibly. Everybody heard it. The angels of heaven heard it. The devils of hell heard it. Satan heard it. And yet when the devil comes with that question, and never forget, every weapon the devil comes at you with is a question. That's his weapon. He said to Eve, did God really say that? So, the word, that's the power of God. There's strength in the word of God. Great peace have they that love your law. Nothing will shake and offend them. Nothing. And Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. I'm not afraid of the devil. I'm afraid of one thing. That old man. That old life. That flesh. Wretched flesh. Who shall deliver me, Paul said, from this wretched self, this body of death. That's your enemy. And there's no place in the Bible it says resist the flesh. It said crucify it. <laughs> How do you crucify it? Starve it. Starve it. The eyes, the ears, that's how it gets in there. What you see, what you hear feeds that old man. Today we have things coming at us from every direction. I grew up in a, in a very innocent world. When I was born in Israel, that's where I'm from, in Jaffa, I was, I was born a block away from the house of Simon the Tanner. I grew up in the Holy Land. Jaffa, the city of Jaffa. I love that city of Jaffa. And yet, and yet, oh dear Lord, that self, oh wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the spot of destruction? 
And today that's our biggest enemy. You can't resist the flesh. You can resist the devil, of course. Not the flesh. You crucify that flesh. You say no to that flesh. You starve that flesh. Don't let anything come into your ears or eyes. It will pollute you. So we grew up in, in an innocent world back then. We all, all we had was radio, even no TV. When I grew up, there was no such thing as an oven or a stove or a fridge. None of that. Today, look, you've got the, the internet and the iPhone and everything else in between. Today, it comes at you from all directions. We need the scriptures because the scriptures keep the spirit of man strong. They keep you strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Now let me get, get, get back to what I was saying. And I'm going to get into something very important. I pray the Lord today will really use this part of his, of, of his precious word. Okay. I want to just ask you a question. Because Paul asked the people in Corinth, he said, examine yourselves whether ye be in faith. Examine yourself. We all have to do it. I love what Proverbs <clears throat> chapter 14 verse 12 says. Listen to this. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Some Christians today believe everything is fine because I believe that. I believe, and I was born again, and, and, and. But they don't realize that the Bible has a lot to say and warn us about this. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Proverbs 30, 12. There is a people, pure in their own eyes, but they're not washed from their filter. Many believed on him, John 8.30, not in him. Later he called them children of the devil. What does it mean to come to Jesus? Well... I'm going to read it to you. You see, I want all of you to make heaven. I really mean it. I really mean it. Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father, his mother, his wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. For whosoever doth not bear his cross... And come after me cannot be my disciple. This life, ladies and gentlemen, is a very short, very, very short life. This is only a test. Our life on earth is just but a test for what he will trust us with eternally. Just, just a test. Why were you born? Why were you born, Pastor Dan? Why were you born, Marie? Why were you born, Chad? Why were you born, people, to know your mom and dad? Oh, brothers and sisters? No, to know the man, Christ Jesus. That's the reason for coming into this world, because mommies and daddies go. No, 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 no. We're not going to heaven because we miss mommy or grandma. Whom do I have in heaven but thee, Lord? And all I desire upon the earth is only you. So people today want to go to heaven because, oh, I miss my grandma. Jesus did not die on the cross. So you can be with your grandma. Are you listening? Is that getting through to you somehow? Okay. 
Well, I, I don't want to go to hell. So I'm going to accept Jesus. He is not a fire escape. Why are you receiving him? To escape hell? Really? He's not a fire escape. Listen here. We receive him to know him. To love him. To serve him. To be loyal unto death to him. He is our all in all. We have no other to go to. To whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of life. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Not grandma. Not grandpa. Not mommy, daddy. Who in heaven, yes, will recognize them. But will there really be mommy and daddy up there? The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about that. We hope so. But I, I, I go back to David. Whom do I have in heaven but thee? You are the reason I'm going, I'm, I'm going to heaven. Look, people, I think by now you know I'm a, I'm a Jesus man. And I'm going to die a Jesus man. My mom is gone. My dad is gone. My brothers and sisters, we don't hardly see each other anymore. My mom would have loved to have said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but she died and couldn't do it. My dad would have loved to have said, I'll never leave you, Benny, but he did. There's only one person who can say and keep the promise, I shall never leave you or forsake you. And he's asking us here that he be first and all in all. Now, you know, let me bring balance to this blessed scripture. Any man that will come to me and, you know, doesn't hate his father or mother. Jesus is not asking you to go hate your parents. Because he said, honor them. Honor your father and mother. Fifth commandment, honor them. But on the cross, when his mom came and brothers came in Galilee, well, your mom is out. He said, who's my mother? Who's my father? Those that are here, they wouldn't do it. But on the cross, he looked down and said, John, take care of her. That's honor. Honor. But it's all about the master. It's all about the Lord completely and totally. And I love what it says in Matthew 11, and we've all read that so many times. We, we, we've sung songs about it. But then you look at it one more time with new eyes, new vision. Come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Coming to Jesus, saints, means turning away from sin. Coming to Jesus means all confidence in self is renounced. All love for sin and the world is renounced. Make Jesus all in all in your life. That's what it means when he said, Come unto me, all you who labor are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Coming to him means repentance. Coming to him means turning away from my sin. Leaving the confidence of self away. Get rid of it. There's no confidence in the flesh. We have none. We have none. Coming to Jesus means this too. I love this. Blessed be your name. Coming to Jesus means, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, walk ye in him. Rooted and built up in him. Established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Coming to Jesus means exactly this in Colossians 2, 6 and 2, 7. Received, have you received Christ? Walk in him. Live for him. <sighs> okay. Can I just say a few more things? Are you people listening to all this? Now listen, listen. We have to grow into righteousness. It's like this. It's like this. So you have, you, you've accepted Jesus. Good. 
You believed in him? Good. How many of you believe in Jesus? Put your hands up high. Okay, so you're, you're in now. You're, you're safe. <laughs> but, 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 but. This is where I'm in right now. This is what I've, I've come to in my life. And this is quite simple. When you look at the book of Romans, it's broken into three parts, basically, for you and I. The first part, Romans 1 to 5, talks about justification. From 6 on through 8, sanctification. Then Paul talks about Israel and God's plan for them. But the third part for me is my duty as a believer from there on. From 12 on, my duty. So Romans 1 to 5, I'm justified. 6, 7, I'm sanctified. 8, 9, 10, 11, Israel and God's plan for them, 12 to the end, my duty as a believer, simple. But many people have not understood sanctification. When God declares you righteous, once you believe in him, he says, you're in. I declare you righteous, but that has to do with what? You have been forgiven, your penalty of sin is gone. He declares you righteous that your sin in the past is forgiven but that does not change hear this now because there is the penalty of sin and the power of sin and then the presence of sin so when i got saved i was free from the penalty now i must be free from the power when jesus comes he'll set me he'll set me free from the presence of sin but to, but today we have a job God declares us righteous, let's grow into that righteousness. As we grow into that righteousness, the power of sin in our life will diminish. Do you get that? Sanctification sets us free from the power of sin. This is very important. When you got saved, Jesus set you free from the penalty of sin. Today, as you grow into that righteousness and walk in that righteousness called sanctification, you'll be free from the power of sin. When Jesus comes, you'll be free from the presence of sin. Then you'll be with him forever. But the job we have today is grow into his righteousness. From glory to glory, let him change and sanctify you and perfect you in him and the only way I've known, and with that, I close. Just real gentle right here. The Lord insisted that we have to forsake all. Because he said, entering heaven demands that you strive to enter in. And that's what sanctification is all about. He insisted we have to forsake all to be his disciples. Simple. But he said one thing you have to do. Take the cross with you in this journey. Take your cross and follow me. And I have wondered in my past life, I have wondered what does it mean to carry your cross? It means to embrace it. Now please hear me and I'm done with this. Because this is very important. We have to embrace, number one, the shame of the cross. The shame of the cross means I accept the offense of the cross. Galatians 5.11 talks about the offense of the cross or persecution. We rejoice when we are persecuted. So the cross to me represents what? Shame, persecution. Embracing the shame of the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, they mocked him and spit on him. Shame. We accept that persecution. 300 million believers today are under persecution worldwide. Who've accepted the shame of Calvary. Number two, it represents weakness. 
The cross brings you to the end of yourself because it says in 2 Corinthians 13, Jesus died in weakness. What does it mean? It means it brings me to the end of myself, to the end of my resources, where now I completely depend on him to carry me through. And then it represents death. The cross came to finish you. The solution for ongoing sin is the cross. And that happens daily. So believing in Jesus is way more than I believe that, 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 that. I trust him totally to carry me and keep my soul, keep my life. He's my all. And I forsake all to follow him. And I embrace the cross, its shame, its weakness, and its death with joy. I never used to think like this 10 years ago till I read Fox's Book of Martyrs. A long time ago in this country, every Christian home had two books, the Bible and Fox's Book of Martyrs. The, 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 the cost is high, says. I did not understand why Catherine Kuhlman talked about death all the time. She'd say, you gotta die. You gotta die. I had no clue what she meant. Catherine Kuhlman died a long time ago. You have to, and she was so dramatic. You gotta die. I was so... Ah. I went home. When I heard her say, you gotta die, I got on my knees, I said, dear Jesus, please kill me. <laughs> I didn't know what she meant by you gotta die. Die to the things of this world, die to the things of life. Die to the pressures of life, die to the cares of this world. I'm gonna understand that, put your hands up high. Let it all go. Let it all die, it means nothing. It means nothing. I used to sit after my crusades and watch history. History, I loved history. I'd sit with my staff, talk about Churchill and the Second World War and Hitler and Stalin. I knew the very details of that history. Do you know, dear Andrew, I wrote a book on the Palestinian-Israeli issue and the one who wrote my foreword was the former Prime Minister of Israel and said, I know more about Israel than he did. How many people read that book? How many? It didn't sell. Because people, because people connected me with Good Morning Holy Spirit, not Blood in the Sand. That's what I call the book, Blood in the Sand. History, I wasted my time reading history. What, what, what did, did I gain? Zero. Today, I'm having to do some catch-up work. Read the Bible. I know the Bible today way more than I did 10 years ago. Because no more, no more TV, no more direct, no more this, no more, no more that. Just straight in the Word. And I'll tell you what happens. The Word triggers fellowship with God. You don't have to struggle to pray. You'll pray if you really get into it. Because you'll discover the God who loves you and you'll start talking to Him. And fellowship triggers worship. And you're there for two hours and don't even feel it. You come out of that room, you, you're thinking you're gonna float. Peace that passeth all understanding. Peace that really is real and heavenly. Not the peace that you think is natural, it doesn't last. When you read the word, can I give you a little, a little tips? Never read chapters, read thoughts. Read thoughts, because you can meditate on the thoughts. The Bible is, is broken into thoughts, like Genesis 1 to 11 is one thought, the story of men. 12 to 24, Abraham. 24 on, Isaac. From, from 28 on, Jacob. Then you come to the children of Jacob, and then you come to Joseph. You break it down like this, you can go back and meditate on every part by itself. It'll nourish your soul. Actually, the same thing. All the books of the Bible. You just sit there and let that marvelous word and its nutrients get into your spirit, man. And when, and it's not mental, it's not mental. Meditation is not, it's spiritual. 
it's enjoying the moment. Enjoy. So I, I'm, I'm reading Jeremiah 3, give you a little, a little idea. I'm reading Jeremiah 3 and God says to Jeremiah, he says, he says, is that an abomination? If a wife leaves her husband, marries another, then goes back to her first husband, the land will be polluted. But God says, I say to Israel, you've gone out with many husbands and lovers, but I'll take you back. It shook me up. I thought, wait a minute, Lord, you told Moses that that's forbidden. Moses wrote and said, if a husband marries a girl and she or he leave and she marries another and goes back to the first man, it's an abomination. It'll pollute the land. God says to Israel, okay, you've run around with many husbands. I want you back. And I just, it hit me. I thought, dear God, what kind of God are you? I was weeping, talking to him. Prayer is triggered by the word. A prayer list goes nowhere, nowhere, because you're gonna yawn and fall asleep. You, you've said the stuff a whole million times. You can go through your whole prayer. Look, your entire prayer list won't even last five minutes. Lord, da 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 da, amen, bye. No, 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 get the word. Get him to talk to you. Take two hours a day, start with half an hour, but increase it, it'll change your life. It'll change your life and that word will penetrate into your heart and then the change will come. Lift your hands to heaven. Lord, I have given them the best I could now. But I pray, precious Savior, that they will receive that new hunger, new hunger for your word. And Lord, transform them with it. That they might completely yield their life and vessels to you. Do it, Lord. For your glorious name's sake. I give you the praise. The word in the Christian life is not try or try harder. Yield. Yield your members as instruments of righteousness. God never said, try to live the Christian life or try harder. He said, yield. Yield is simple. Yield is surrender. That's it. You surrender today to the chair you're sitting on without checking the legs if they'll hold you. You had faith enough that the chair will hold you. That's yielding to a chair. That's letting go. It's time to let go. Your Jesus, your glorious, preparing us your temple. Born as living stones Where you're enthroned As you rose From death in power Come rise within Our worship Rise upon our praise Let the hand That saw you raise Clothe us in your glory. Draw us by your grace. Sing with me now. Oh, the glory of your presence. We your temple. Give you reverence. So arise to your rest and be blessed by our praise as 
we glory. In your embrace, as your presence, Lord, everyone standing, please. Alleluia. and love him. You're all I need You're all I need 
Jesus, you're all I need. You're all I need. You're all I need. Jesus, you're all. eyes closed. You're all, you're all I need. Just a whisper. Those sick in body, place your hand on that sickness now. I'm going to pray for you that God will heal you tonight. And I step into my office. Lord, I pray in your holy name, heal your people. I rebuke sickness. I rebuke disease. I rebuke that infirmity in the name of Jesus. that sickness to go now your word declares he was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities chastised for our peace with his stripes were healed heal your wonderful people Lift your hands, receive your healing. The anointing is here now. Some of you are sensing and feeling a warmth on your body. Holy Spirit. 
Someone to my right has just been healed of arthritis. You sensed a warmth atmosphere come on your body. You've had pain in your right shoulder and neck. Begin to move that shoulder and move that neck. You'll find that pain is leaving you right now. Just one more time. Holy. A skin condition straight ahead of me has just been healed. I give you praise, Lord. A circulation problem has just been healed. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The healing anointing is falling here already. Everyone lift your hands and pray out loud in the Holy Ghost for just a few moments. An eye disease has just been healed. A back injury has just been healed. Someone's leg, someone's leg. You fell and injured it just a few days ago. The pain is leaving you now. I give you praise, Lord. A blood disease, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. As you rose from death and power, another skin condition on the balcony, I rebuke it. Many of you are feeling like a heat on your body. That's the mighty power of God healing you. That's the mighty power of the Holy Spirit healing you. Cancer, I rebuke that stomach cancer. I rebuke that stomach cancer in Jesus' mighty name. A neck injury. Move that neck, the pain is gone. Somebody's left ear just popped open. Somebody's ear just popped open. Yes, Lord, thank you. There's a gum disease being healed. A lady, a lady to my left with a gum disease being healed. Keep praying, keep praying for just a few more minutes. Lord, I thank you for this. That heart condition, I rebuke it in Jesus' name. Those headaches, I rebuke them in Jesus' name. Many of you feel that sensation of beautiful warmth. Some feel intense heat, others feel like a gentle warmth. If God is touching you and you know it, if the Lord is healing you and you know it, get out of your seats. Keep praying in the Holy Ghost, everyone. If you know the Lord is touching you, if you sense His blessed anointing, and you know He's healing you, get out of your seat quickly and come line up here to my left. Come line up here to my left. Everyone pray, lift your voices and pray. If you sense the anointing, if you sense the anointing on your body, begin to do what you were not able to do before and quickly get into that line over here. If you know God is healing you, just get out of your seat and come line up over there quickly, 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 quick, very quickly. Glaucoma, I rebuke that glaucoma. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke that glaucoma. A lady on the balcony, you've had suicidal thoughts. I command that demon, let her go. In Jesus' name, let her go. Keep praying, people of God, keep praying. If the Lord is healing you, you need to come to that side. What happened to her quickly? Bring her up here, bring her up here. A lady that was just healed of the gum disease. Come, that come, you come, just quickly, called out. quickly. Dear Jesus, dear we'll Jesus. Uh, dear Jesus, I give you praise. Bring them up one by one quickly, one by one quickly. People, lift your hands and just pray. Keep praying. A lot of you are getting healed, I know. Bring him up, come on, Marie, quickly. Or Chad, come on. This lady what happened to her? Pastor Benny, this lady was just healed of glaucoma. When you called it out, the Lord healed her tonight of glaucoma. Bring her up, bring her up, bring her up. Oh, praise God. Oh, thanks. This lady was just healed in her left eye, Pastor Benny. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. Oh. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, this dear lady, Jesus. This lady, when you called out gum disease, heat dear in her Jesus, mouth, the Lord dear healed Jesus, that gum dear disease. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. 
Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. People lift your hands and just pray. Lift your hands and just pray. Just pray. Pastor Benny, this young lady had a huge lump on her right breast. It's gone. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. Help them up, help them up, let's go. Bring the one here that had the lump. Bring the one here that had the lump. Pick. Come, 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 my dear. Come, come, come. Where was walking my feet? Totally gone. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. Help him up, help him up. Oh, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. What happened to him? This man's hearing. The Lord just healed his hearing. His, he, he can hear me, is that? Can you hear me? Well, take those hearing aids off. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you still hear me? I give you praise. I give you praise. Pick him up. Come on, quickly bring him up. Give me some volume, please. How long have you been deaf for? How long have you been deaf for? 25, 30 years. You can hear me now. You know. You can hear me now. I can hear you. Thanks. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. What happened there? Pastor Benny, when you called out this, the skin condition, when you called out the skin condition, this young man is, feels like on fire. The skin oh, condition oh, thanks, was healed. Thanks. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Take your seats, take your seats, take your seats, take your seats. Don't leave because God is not done yet. Come, come, come. <laughs> A blood condition, the Lord just healed warmth what, in her what, body. What, what, what a blood say? condition. Blood, blood. Oh, there go. Help her up, help her up, help her up. Thanks, 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 thanks. Here's another skin condition, the second dear one, Jesus, all pain dear is Jesus, gone. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. Help him up, guys, let's go. What happened, what happened? An issue with my heart. An issue Brother, with the heart. You need another dose. An issue with the heart, and the Lord healed Think him tonight. Think about where that man was sitting, someone next to him got the overflow. And you were healed. That, 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 whoever was sitting next to him had arthritis. Completely gone. Look at that healing line. Dear God, look at that healing line. What happened here? Heart condition. A heart condition. His heart, huh? Yes, sir. Oh. Pick him up. Thanks. Bring him back. Guys. It's flowing here. Let's go, let's go. Pick him up, pick the people up so we can have space. Pastor Benny, stage four cancer, couldn't breathe, but she's breathing now. Wait, wait, hold, hold, hold. You have cancer? Where? She didn't even speak, chronic pain. You had cancer in your lungs and your bones. Did you have pain? Is the pain there? The pain in your head and your legs. I rebuke it. Stretch your hands towards her quickly. Quickly and just pray. Just a second. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. You see, the anointing had to switch from preaching, teaching, to healing. That's why I have to worship, all right? It's one thing I... That girl is having a glorious experience. Just a second. Keep praying for a second. Your presence makes me whole. Dear Jesus, I rebuke this cancer. Ah, oh. whoa, I rebuke this cancer. Check the pain. Check the pain. Where was the pain? Check it now. Check it in your legs. Is it gone? Is the pain gone? 
What happened here? Mr. Benny, this, this lady, chronic pain for three years. She could barely stand. The pain is gone tonight. God healed the what? chronic wait, wait, pain. Wait, wait, hold, hold. What caused the pain? Jesus, you're glorious. Help her up. Chad, come on. What was wrong with you? It was a uh, castrochondritis, but... <laughs> you had pain or what? Me, don't even bother going because they're not going to find it, but I couldn't take it anymore. So I went and they couldn't figure it out, but I just kept leaving. <laughs> Give me your hand. Let's walk together. Come on, girl. Let it go. That's God Almighty. All right. Pastor, you can, you, you can take her down. Pastor Benny, this man had weeks, months to live, cancer. While you were ministering, come, he come, felt come. it pulled out of his body. He's whole right now. Wait, 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 hold, hold. What happened now? Weeks, months to live. Keep talking. Weeks, months to live with cancer while you were preaching. He felt something pulled out of his body and feels pain free now. Get him up. No pain? Where was the pain? Uh, here. And all over the abdomen in the area of that. I was also healed of a broken heart. Okay, how about the cancer? What it was here? It's gone. I know it's gone. No, it's gone. I'm gone. gone. Yeah. That's good. I love it. Thank God. What happened to the lady? A right hip over 10 years. But tonight she was healed by the power oh. of the Holy Ghost. Pick her up. Which hip was it, darling? Both the right hip for over 10 years, the left hip in the last few years. Let's go. You know, check it out. Check it out. It was the sitting and folding my legs that I couldn't do, but I did. Oh. What happened? Another skin condition. The Lord is healing skin conditions tonight. I cannot believe how many people have been healed here in such a short time. Now, listen, listen. In just a second, I got to say good night and not keep here all night. Just give me just five more minutes. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Four years, couldn't bend her knees. The Lord healed her. She can bend and squat and everything fast. Pick her up. I, I, I love it, darling. I, what happened there? You called out a popping in the ear. Excess fluid, it popped and it's gone. He's wait, healed. Wait. What was wrong with his ear? Excess fluid in his ear. It popped out and he was healed. Oh. Can we give the Lord a mighty hand of prayer? What happened to the lady? Bursitis in the hip. Hey, listen. When they can't when they can't speak English, just lay hands on them. What happened? Quick. It has to be a breathing condition, but this lady can breathe normally now by the Holy Ghost. What happened? A motorcycle accident injured her leg. The Lord healed her tonight. The pain is gone and her leg is healed. Bring her here. Bring her. Touch every bed of her, Lord. Move your legs, honey. God bless you. Bring them this way. Bring them this way. Bring them this way. Bring them this way, brother. It's not by eloquence or talent. You know the song, yes or no? Play it. I'm sorry, people. When the anointing comes, I get bold. It's got to be just happening just right. It's not by eloquence that God's work is done. 
not by might nor by power but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts this very hour the anointing of the Lord heavenly brother breaks the yoke of bondage the anointing of the Lord There is ministry in that man's future. Lots of ministry in that man's future. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit. His ears and his eyes were healed tonight. God just touched both. Thou art welcome in this place. See, I, I, I feel the winds are shifting, so I got to flow with the winds. Thou art welcome. I want to pray for you, brother. This is not time to work. Of mercy and grace, thou art welcome. In this place, fill all the hungry and thirsty within. Restore us, O oh Father. Revive us again. Oh, you need this. <laughs> Thou art not her yet. Thou art welcome in this place. Restore, Lord, his strength. Restore, Lord, his strength. You know, spiritually, sometimes when people minister, they, their, their strength leaks a little bit, you know. And sometimes all they need is just a little dose of it. Just a little strength. Strength for the day. There's a special heart in here. Heart of gold. Yes, Lord, increase his, please, his sensitivity. This is a pliable man. He's pliable, Lord. Make him more pliable. More pliable. You know, pliable, that pliability is so needed in the Spirit's life. Like where God can move you in any direction He wants, like the wind. Just liable, Lord. You already have it in you, but it's going to increase. There's coming a great, like I see you becoming so, how shall I say, moved with the winds. Understanding the currents of the winds like the eagle. For in thy presence. Yeah. Yes. You're his wife, I guess. She is. Come here, darling, come here. Put your hands out like this. Your hands like that. Just put your hands out like that. That's it. No, your hands. Just keep them by there. <laughs> keep them just like this. <laughs> For in thy presence there's healing divine. I want to hear that heavenly sound. No other power can heal, Lord, but thine. Now you're going to start feeling something on your hands. Close your eyes. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome.
See, the Lord is anointing her hands, and she's feeling warmth on them. When, when did you start feeling it? That warmth. When? When I was blowing good. Now God is charging you. Lay hands on the sick. And as you do, in trust, in complete confidence in the Lord, you'll see it happen. That's been a great desire of yours. Pick her up. Pick her up. Yes. Keep her down. Now you all lift your hands to heaven. Holy Spirit. What happened there? This is amazing. She had a neck injury, could not move her neck. Look at her moving her neck. The Holy Spirit healed well, there's her. There's a lot of there's a lot of healings tonight. Lots of beautiful healings. But God wants to do something deep here. Help her up. You go sit with your husband. She is so sweet. I see something in your leg. I'm not sure what I'm looking at, but I see something in your leg. Are you are you in the ministry? What do you do? You're yeah, you're now what? Chief of staff here. Okay, come here a second. The Lord is going to give you incredible boldness against the devil. And I saw you kicking, doing this. And I'm thinking, Lord, why am I seeing something on his leg? He said, tell him, he will be bold against the enemy. The Bible tells us, be strong in the Lord. Oh, dear God. Use him, Lord. Use him, Lord. Use him, Lord. Strong in you. Mighty in you. In the holy name of Jesus, Lord, boldness, 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 boldness. Boldness. Ah, oh, he needs that. A strength in his boldness. You got a tough job, but start using that leg against the enemy, brother. You know, sometimes kicking is symbolic of power. The enemy is not as strong as he claims to be, you're much stronger. And your position here, you have to be bold and strong. Don't let anything affect you. And start kicking the devil. I don't mean physically, of course, spiritually. It's a kick clock. Get him out of there. And sometimes he'll come across through someone as friendly. It's very tough to keep a ministry organized. Very tough. I'll talk to you afterwards about something. I want to talk to you privately. Help her up. That's your wife? Okay. I don't know who she is, but she's really being blessed. Lord, thank you for what you're doing deep in her soul. Oh, 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 oh. I just saw it. Oh, God, I just saw it. That wound, my dear, and that heart of yours is being healed. I'm sensing that wound. Oh, dear God, I'm sensing that. Lord, you heal the brokenhearted. Do it now. Do it now. Sometimes hidden injuries are only revealed under the anointing. Now, all of you sweet people who've been healed, bring her here, but everyone else go back to your seat. Yes, all of you that came forward, just go back to your seats. 
because we have to dismiss so we don't keep you here till midnight. Okay. He's here right now. He's here right now. Yeah, I want to pray for her. We don't need to wait. Who's with her? We don't need to beg. He's passing out gifts for you to receive. How did you get? Lord, heal her. Let this be the beginning of that miracle in her body. In the name, above every name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, keep her down here for about five minutes. Everyone go, go to your seat and sit down. How many of you, thank you, how many of you tonight heard the word I brought? Put your hands up high. Okay. It's very simple. It's very simple. Trust. Complete faith in the Lord. Surrendering your life and your all and your future and your family and your possessions and all in between. See? We just give it all to Him and trust Him completely. That's really basically my message. It's not that we believe this and that, 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 that. It's we completely yield to the Lord. And like I said at the end, and please don't leave, just stay where you are, just only 10 more minutes. It's not about trying, it's about yielding. That's the Christian life. Now, before you leave, I'm gonna ask you to give to the Lord's work, but please listen to me here. There's three keys to financial blessings. Three, quite simple, I've learned that the hard way, by the way. Number one, love the Lord. Number two, love his word. But number three, obey. That's the tough one. Obedience is necessary. Oral Roberts was in our church years ago. And I took the offering before I gave him the platform on a Sunday morning. And he said, Benny, can I talk to you like my son? I said, yes. He said, you take lousy offerings. I said, why you say that? He said, because you focused on the seed, not the harvest. And then he takes me, sits me down on the couch in, in the office in the back. He said, let's go to Luke 6, 38. I did. He said, how many times does it say give? I said, one time. How many times does it say receive? I said, I don't know. He said, well, look at it again. So I looked and read. I, I still could not see how many times it said. And then he took, my, he took my, my hand like this. He said, Jesus said, receive seven times. It shall be given unto you. Good measure. Man, I'm cracking your thing here. <laughs> His fingers were pop, 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 pop. I think you need that too. It should be given unto you. That's what Oral did to me. Good measure, press down, shaking together, running over, shall man give to your bosom. I said, do that again. And he did it seven times. He says, focus on the harvest. Tell God what you want financially. I said, well, I've never done that. He said, why? You ask God for all kinds of things to give you and do for you. Why don't you ask him to help you financially? And then he said, what do you need? I said, well, we, we just bought a house and we want to pay off the house. He said, all right, tell God. Okay, I told the Lord. And then Oral said something powerful. He said, Benny, when you give that envelope, write on the back of it what you want. Release your faith in writing, not just in asking. So I wrote on the envelope, Lord, please help me pay the house. Get me out of, you know, out of debt. We just bought a house for $300,000 at the time in Orlando, and we want to pay it off. So I wrote on the envelope, I'm going to pay off the house. Every Sunday I do the same thing, put the offering in. One that the Lord said, do you believe it? I said, yes. He said, praise me. I said, Lord, I praise you. I'm going to pay off the house. I still didn't, did not have the money. We had a man in our church named Emil Tannis, his wife Joyce. And Joyce always came with her hair fixed like, a, like the tower, uh, the Eiffel Tower. 
and she always wore a, a jewel on top of her blonde hair, and she'd walk in that thing, did this, when she walked down the aisle. So I said one day to her, I said, Joyce, if you ever go swimming, you'll drown. Because she had so many rings and jewelry everywhere. So that man sold his business in Fort Myers, where he had a garbage business, he sold it. He took me out to dinner with my wife, hands me, hands me an envelope, and in that envelope was $300,000. And I'm thinking, oh, the God, it works. Oral is right. Listen, people of God, it's the law of God. We activate it with a seed. But let's believe God that he will give us the harvest. The harvest. We focus on the harvest. We tell God, here's what I want. Now, we can't say to him, Lord, I'm going to give you money. Please heal my body. No, 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 no. That's an act of faith in a whole different realm. Okay? For financial blessings, we give financially. I've said this many, many times. I'll say it again. If you want a spiritual miracle, act spiritually. If you want a physical healing, act physically. Jesus said, get up and walk. If you want a financial miracle, you act financially. You literally give, and then God will give you back way more than you can ever expect. And believe me, I've learned that the hard way. The hard way. So I'm going to ask you tonight to give to the Lord's work. And I want you to tell the Lord, Lord, here's what I am believing for. It's happened to me time and time and time again. Giving gets you out of trouble, even legal trouble. I'm in the Holy Land. I was going through a lawsuit. Very tough one. I'm praying at the wailing wall, and I said, Lord, you said in Psalm 41 that if we take care of the poor, you'll not Deliver us to the will of our enemies, and I have enemies. Set me free from those enemies. And I made a vow to God to help children who were orphans. I called my lawyer. I said, please call the judge. See if they'll put a gag order on the deal because it was kind of a messy thing. He said, there's no way the judge won't even accept it. She even hates, she, the judge hates, you know, evangelists on, on TV, especially you, she, he said. I said, look, you do your job, I do my job. The minute I said, Lord, I'll give you $10,000. An hour later, my phone rings. He says, I don't, I don't know how you've done this. The judge canceled the case. <laughs> Giving has power. Has power. How many, of you have, how many of you sweet people need a financial miracle now? Put your hands up high. Stretch your hands towards me, come on. Stretch your hands towards me. I'm stretching my hands towards you. My faith is high for this. Lord, in Jesus' name, grant their desire. And Lord, we agree that financial need will be met in Jesus' name. And God's people said? Amen. All right. So go ahead and sow your seed. But right now, let's just believe God that every one of you that are believing God for that financial need to be met, it will be met. And the people of God said, yes. now when, when you hold that envelope, or if you're giving another way, put your hands on it. You lay your hands on it and, and just agree with your husband or your friend. Come into agreement that that need will be met. I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Because there's power in there, tremendous power. It's happened over and over and over in my life where I've had more needs than you'll ever have financially. And I just gave. And sometimes it was really hard to give. But you obey and it works. God will bless us when we love him. God will bless us when we love his word. And God will, will really bless us when we obey. I think that girl has had enough down here. Come on. Okay. Obedience triggers the harvest. Obedience releases the harvest when you sow. But before you sow, tell God what you want. And then agree with your wife or friend 
or husband or family member that God will do it. And tell him when. Tell him when. Be specific with the Lord. When do you need that harvest? You tell him. He'll do it every single time. Dear Andrew, I needed $100,000 overnight. We were dealing with another situation, and uh, the lawyer called and said, if you can come up, come, come up with 100000 by morning, it'll, it'll be all over. I said, I don't know where I'm going to you know, get 100000 The Lord spoke to me to give. The second he spoke, and I obeyed, he said, call Linda. It was a lady named Linda and Wright in Phoenix. That morning, the Lord spoke to her that I needed $100,000. She said, Lord, if this is you, have him call me. And I called her. And she was screaming on the phone, oh my God, oh my God, I told her. And that 100,000 came the next morning, FedEx on time. Sometimes we have to tell God, I need it by tomorrow. And you come into agreement, it will happen, believe me. Lift your hands and thank him, he'll do it. Amen. Lord, you promised and we believe. We give you all the praise. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. So can we come now and pass the offering buckets? And I want to say to Brother Andrew, thank you for having me. I loved it tonight. And I appreciate it so, so, so much. And what a beautiful, what a beautiful facility you have here. And I know a lot of you, I think, are, uh, you've got a school here. How many are students or part of the school that's wonderful well I pray the Lord will bless all of you and keep and keep you as the apple of the eye and God's people said